with pain in the knees. I sat with pain in my knees through white tantric yoga for a few years, um, just trying to grin and bear through it. And I just would recommend don't ever do that. <laughs> Coming from someone who learned the hard way. Um, so always find a way to sit where your knees are about the same height as your hips. Um, so there's no pressure. If you're too high in your hips, you put pressure down into the knees, right? If you're too low and the knees are high, you actually create, you probably feel it more in the hips. Mm -hmm. But still, it's, it's not a comfortable sensation. Yes. So what do you do with someone that literally, because I know someone who literally cannot sit in any pose because of his knees? Then they're going to sit in a chair. Yeah. We just um, were on retreat um, with a group of people, and we had a very large man as part of the retreat. Um, and he couldn't sit on the floor. He just, he just couldn't. He was, there was too much of him. So he sat up on a chair. And he couldn't really do many of the kriyas. But our instruction to him was simply um, do in your body something that feels similar to what everybody else is doing. And stay present. And he would be in there and tears streaming down his face. And he would, you know, he melted down a couple of times just just facing himself in a way that he hadn't before. You know, often I think when people become obese, they're so disconnected from their body. But if you invite them in a gentle way just to, to get present, and that was, um, that was during Thanksgiving, and he's lost 35 pounds since wow. then. Wow. He's wow. been doing sadhana every morning, and um, he's committed to a new path of health. Wow. And so it's really possible... Um, to f always find something that someone can do. And a lot of the time we're being creative as teachers, right? You don't have to know the answer. You just look and you creatively figure something out with the person in a way that they can stay engaged. Yes? What did you do a white tantric that wasn't easy pose then? As someone who's had knee pain after... So there's two choices. You can um, find a position that does work for you, or you can sit in rock pose with a cushion under you, or you could get one of the little Buddhist um, seats where you sit in rock pose, but you're sitting on the seat. Make sense? A stool. And then they have, so they have a stool that you sit on, and then they have another part that helps keep your shins up slightly, and so you feel fully supported. Or you can sit in a chair at White Tantric, too. It's just being humble enough to be like, okay, I'm going to be one of the chair people, and I'm going to take care of myself. <laughs> you know? And so, and, um, but it is important, um, because if, if, if we're so preoccupied by something that is an injury, different than just the sheer mental and will to hold an arm up, right? But if we're so preoccupied with an injury and pain, it's very hard to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. And um, and it creates a certain level, I think, of just internal worry that doesn't need to be there. Um, so, ligaments. Uh, fibrous band-like structures that link bone to bone. Non-contractile, i.e. we can't, we can't shorten it. Um, poor blood supply, and they're used to stabilize joints. So some of us are born with tighter ligaments than others. Right? You, you guys all know some floppy, flexible people. Some of you will be floppy, flexible people. <laughs> so you are just born with ligaments that give you a little bit more space. So the thing about ligaments is, if we overstretch them, they don't go back. If you stretch a muscle, um, it'll contract back. I mean, you can create a new set length in your muscle by holding for a long period of time or doing it daily in the sadhana, where you'll gradually lengthen and create a new set length in that muscle. But when it comes to ligaments, if you stretch the ligament, it's stretched there. And then what happens is you create instability in that joint. So do you guys know the times that you could stretch a ligament versus a muscle? When you're cold. When you're cold and stiff, and you start to stretch, like in uh, a deep forward bend, um, and especially if you go at it aggressively, what you'll end up doing is you'll start to pull at the, at the ligaments and tendons more than the muscles. 
Make sense? Mm -hmm. So warm up is important. Warm up for your muscles is important. It's like um, you want to cook the spaghetti to make it <laughs> elastic. Same kind of thing with your muscles. Well, shoulder ligaments, because they're very small, there's hardly, there's hardly nothing there, um, and uh, knees, it's easy to overstretch the knees. And ladies, when you're pregnant, you get more relaxin in the body, or a hormone called relaxin, and that um, uh, makes your ligaments and things stretch, so you can definitely overstretch, especially in your hip muscles when you're pregnant. Set, exactly, right around the, the lower back, the SI joint. Yeah, so, so yeah, exactly. Um, muscles. Um, this is how we move the skeleton, right? You contract one muscle, the skeleton moves. Um, but let's see, there's different kinds of muscles. There's the cardiac muscle, the involuntary, um, functions without conscious thought, thank goodness. <coughs> then you've got the smooth, the organ muscles, which are involuntary, um, like the uh, peristalsis in the um, digestive tract. You've got the skeletal muscles that move the bones, which is voluntary. Um, so we're going to focus mostly on the, the muscles that move the bones. So... Um, if I contract my bicep, just really simply, right, I, I move on which part, which bone is stable, I move the other bone towards it, right? If this part was stable and I contracted my bicep, I pull myself forward. Make sense? Mm -hmm. When one muscle contracts, there's a, we call it an agonist muscle, the antagonist, the opposite one, relaxes. So... Usually, muscles work in pairs. If I contract my bicep, my tricep needs to lengthen. If I contract my tricep, my bicep needs to lengthen. That's important when it comes to stretching muscles because that means that if you, can, if you want to stretch, for example, your hamstring, if you want to signal to the body to stretch, to open and release the hamstring, you want to make sure you contract your thighs. So it's easy just to flop forward and feel like you want to stretch your hamstrings. But to really significantly improve that stretch, you come forward, but you firm your thighs. And that signals your hamstrings to release. Make sense? Yeah. So there's a science in how that works, and it's the intelligence of the body that knows what to do. And when you start to stretch and move and be in the poses that way, rather than just taking the outer form that you see, but actually making it alive from the inside out, that's when we start to have much more dramatic effects, not only energetically, which of course we love in Kundalini Yoga, but also you'll start to feel it in your physical body. If you start to do forward bends in that way, then you'll notice how much more um, loose your hamstrings will get. We get more flexibility there. More flexibility in the hamstrings particularly is really good because it helps your lower back. If your hamstrings are tight, it tends to pull you into a posterior tilt in the pelvis. And that flattens your back. When the back's flat, we have much less um, spring in the spine. And so it starts to create all kinds of problems, mostly in the SI joint area and we harden in the front body. So all these things tie in together. Um, so the belly of the muscle, and it's largely made of, of protein. The, you know, clearly, I hate, well, I shouldn't say hate, strong form. I, I, it, it's never come smoothly to me. <laughs> to, um, when I hear people talk about eating protein, which is an animal. I don't know why, but just animal flesh just turned into protein as a word just somehow doesn't resonate with me. Maybe it's, it's just a step disconnected from, you know, what it really is. Um, anyway, that was a digression, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they produce the movement of the bones. Um, we maintain stability in part of the skeleton while another part moves. 
So you'll see the, the big fat muscle and then go towards the bone and you'll see the um, tendon, right? Um, so tendons, which we'll come to in a moment, are, um, they're not as um, contractile as uh, ligaments, but they also have very poor blood supply and um, Therefore, when we stretch, overstretch a tendon or we tear a tendon, it's a long recovery time. So here we have it. Non-contractile, connective <coughs> tissue, poor blood supply. Um, when the muscles contract, they exert forces that move the bones and the tendon is really attached to the bone. Um, we're not going to go too much into this, but it's just the, um, and well, actually, it's kind of cool, because can you see the yellow? That's what Yogi Bhajan called the life nerve. It's the sciatic nerve. So people who have sciatic pain, you see the little <coughs> muscle to the right of the um, pelvis uh -huh. that goes out to the right. Um, that little piriformis muscle, that one, if that gets very tight, it can put pressure, you can see, right, on that nerve, and that is, yes, somebody who knows that, um, so that can create um, uh, sciatica, now there's many things that can create sciatica, and that's just another sort of big one that comes up for people in class. There's no one fix for people with sciatica, because it can come from, um, a number of different places. This is just one of the main ones, but um, going into any kind of hip opening pose, right? This here stretches that little muscle that goes out to the side there, and that can ease a lot of sciatica. And you can do this shape lying down on your back, or you can do it in the single pigeon form. You guys are familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Or the double pigeon, where both shins are stacked. And that can really give a lot of relief if you have sciatic pain. Um, so you can see then um, how muscles can affect the nerves if they get tight and stagnant. 7% of the population has a sciatic nerve goes right through the piriformis muscle. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And that's a real pain in the butt. Pain in the butt? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so that is perhaps, that's, that's, quite, that's good, that is perhaps the 7% that, where this one really helps. And then there's the other people, this doesn't really help them, and you have to figure out something else. It's, it's, it's fascinating, this whole body thing. And the thing of it is, it's much like coaching, if you guys have ever, ever done coaching or done a coaching course, the, the patient or the student usually has their own answer. So your job as a teacher is just to keep directing the student in their process of self-inquiry. Mm -hmm. And um, they'll be able to tell you, oh, I did this and actually it felt better. Mm -hmm. Or no, when I do that, it doesn't work. And so you can just help them to find their own medicine. And I think that's a, a good positive way. Did someone have their hand up over here? Yes. strengthening here instead. I, I don't have it at all. Great. Um, so it, it's, it's a testament to, you know, because I was a hacker person. And that yes. Was, you know, and so it, it, yeah. We find the medicine where we need it. <laughs> so muscles um, that have the same action, often grouped together and named by their functions. For example, the hamstring muscles bend the knee, and the calf muscles also help bend the knee. Right? Pretty simple. Hamstrings, back of the legs, and the calf help bend the knee. Um, so they're called knee flexors. Not particularly. Uh, something you need to remember a lot. 
um, fascia. However, this is a connective tissue component of the soft tissue.